I know uh, some of you probably have already read 169 to 72 or are in the process of that, but we're just going to read it really quickly, uh, and then we're going to go over uh, some questions together, uh, and uh, then we'll be done for today. So we're on page um, 169, uh, and uh, interesting title, is it not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you'll, you'll, it, it'll, it'll all make sense. It'll all make sense. So Mother Teresa versus Hitler. Everybody know who Mother Teresa was? Everybody got that? Anybody want to go? I'm not sure. She was a nun um, who um, spent most of her life, um, uh, she became very famous, but uh, who spent most of her life ministering to um, the outcasts in India, especially, and those who had leprosy. Uh, and she got close and personal with um, one of my favorite stories to tell is about uh, watching a, a, a biopic while she was still living. And uh, she was in Israel when Israel and um, Lebanon, Beirut, uh, Lebanon, uh, were at war with her. And she, um, she said she was going to go into Lebanon. There was supposed to be a ceasefire for her to go into Lebanon. And that ceasefire did not hold. And she's having a conversation with um, a man that's kind of, I don't know, her helper or whatever, and says, Mother, you cannot go into the Lebanon. The, the ceasefire is not in place. And she said, I'm going into Lebanon tomorrow. Mother, you, you can't. It's dangerous for you. I'm going into Lebanon tomorrow. And and again, he said, Mother, you, you, you can't. This is, a, this is impossible. She said, I have talked to God, and God has told me that the ceasefire will back and I'm going to Lebanon. That's exactly what happened. She went into Lebanon. She, she was a gutsy, gutsy woman um, and a very, um, very um, uh, spiritual um, follower of Jesus. So um, here's what it says uh, from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is there a standard? My friend Dave and I were just finishing dinner at a dockside restaurant in Portland, Maine, when the conversation turned to religion. I don't think one religion can be exclusively true, Dave said, but it seems like you, Frank, have found your a center. You have found something that's true for you, and I think that's great. Playing along with his premise that something can be true for one person and not for another, I asked Dave, I asked Dave, what's true for you? What makes life meaningful for you? He said, making money and helping people. Now, Dave is a very successful businessman, uh, so I pressed him a little bit more. I said, Dave, I know CEOs who have reached the pinnacle of business success. They planned and achieved great things for their business life and have planned nothing and achieved little in their personal lives. They're now facing retirement, and they're asking themselves, now what? Dave agreed and added, yeah, I, and I know that most of those CEOs have experienced nasty divorces, mostly because they ignored their families in pursuit of a buck. But I'm not like that. I will not sacrifice my family for money. And my in my business, I want to help people as well. I commended him for his commitment to his family and his desire to help people. But questions uh, still remain. Why should we be faithful to our families? Who said we should help people? Is helping people a universal moral obligation, or is it just true for you and not for me? And what and to what end should you help them financially, emotionally, physically, spiritually? I said, Dave, if there's no objective standard, then life is nothing but a glorified monopoly game. You can acquire a lot, a lot of money and lots of property. But when it, the game is over, it's all going back in the box. Is that all life is all about? Uh, is that what life is all about? Unco uncomfortable with the direction of the conversation, Dave quickly changed the subject. 
but his sense that he ought to help people was correct. He just had no way of justifying it. Why did he think he should help people? Where did he get such an idea? And why do you and I deep down agree with him? Stop and marinate on that point for a minute. Aren't you just like Dave? Don't you have this deep-seated sense of obligation that we all ought to help people? We all do. And why do most human beings seem to have the same intuitive sense that they ought to do good and shun evil? Behind the answers to those questions is more evidence for a theistic God. This evidence is not scientific. That's what we've seen in previous chapters, but moral in nature. Like the laws of logic and mathematics, this evidence is non-material, but it's just as real. The reason we believe we ought to do good rather than evil, the reason we, like Dave, believe we should help people, is because there's a moral law that has been written on the hearts, on our hearts. In other words, there is a prescription to do good that can be that has been given to all of humanity. Some call this moral prescription conscience. Others call it nature's natural law. Still others, like our founding fathers, refer to it as nature's law. We refer to it as the moral law. But whatever you call it, the fact that moral law, a moral law standard has been prescribed on the minds of all humans points, human beings points to a moral law prescriber. Every prescription as a prescriber, the moral law is no different. Someone has to be ha, have given us these moral obligations. The moral law is our third argument for the existence of a theistic God, after the cosmological and the teleological. So the, the, the cosmological is the argument for the beginning of the universe. The teleological argument is the argument of the design of the universe. And now we have this moral law, and it goes like this. One, every law has a lawgiver. Two, there is a moral law. And three, therefore, there is a moral lawgiver. If the first and second premises are true, then the conclusion necessarily follows. Of course, every law has a lawgiver. There can be no legislation unless there's a legislature. Moreover, if there are moral obligations, there must be someone to be obligated to. Uh, but, it is real, but is it really true that there is a moral law? Our founding fathers thought so. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, nature's law is self-evident. You don't use reason to discover it. You just know it. Perhaps that's why my friend Dave hit a roadblock in his thinking. He knew helping people was right, the right thing to do. But he couldn't explain why with why without appealing to a standard outside himself. Without an objective standard of meaning and morality, then life is meaningless. And there's nothing absolutely right or wrong. Everything is merely a matter of opinion. When we say the moral law exists, we mean that all people are impressed with a fundamental sense of right and wrong. Uh, everyone knows, for example, that love is superior to hate and courage is better than cowardice. University of Texas uh, at Austin, Professor Jay, and you can figure it out, writes, uh, everyone knows certain principles. There is no land where murder is a virtue and gr gratitude is vice. C.S. Lewis, who has written profoundly on this topic in his classic work, and my favorite book, Air Christianity, put it this way. Think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, or where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people he had been kindest to him. You might as well try to imagine a country where two of two may five. In other words, everyone knows there are uh, absolute moral obligations. An absolute moral obligation is something that is binding on all people at all times and in all places. That's a good thing for you to know. It, it, nobody is exempt from it. And an absolute moral law uh, implies an absolute moral law giver. Now, this does not mean that every moral issue is, has easily recognizable answers or that some people don't deny that absolute morality exists. There are difficult, th these are, there are difficult problems in morality and people suppress 
uh, and deny the moral law every day. A simple, it simply means that there are basic principles of right and wrong that everyone knows whether they will admit them or not. Bajewski calls this basic knowledge of right and wrong uh, what we can't not know uh, in the book of that, uh, by that title. We can't not know, for example, that it is wrong to kill innocent human beings for no reason. Some people may deny it and commit murder anyway, but deep in their hearts, they know murder is wrong. Even serial killers know murder is wrong. They just may not feel remorse. And like all absolute moral laws, murder is wrong for everyone. Uh, in a, uh, for every is is uh, every country. I'm sorry. Murder is wrong for everyone, everywhere, in America, India, Zimbabwe, and in every other country, now and forever. That's what the moral law tells every human. Okay, now we can move into a um, little atheist book. Uh, we're on page 50 and 51, or we'll be on 51 or 52. So the main idea is the moral law is perhaps the greatest proof of the existence of a theistic God. It's hard to deny the fact that people know right from wrong, and that's absolute morality, and that uh, absolute morality exists. So point three gives us these um, these these uh, four um, bullet points. It is true that if a uh, theistic God exists, this is evidence by the beginning of the universe, the design of the universe, the design of life and the world of law. So um, number, a quick question number one says this. Thank you. Uh, so what are some different names for the moral law? What's one of them? Yes, conscience. Conscience. What's another one, Seamus? Nature's law. What's another one? Natural law. So nature's law, conscience, natural law, it all means the same thing. The book calls it the moral law because um, we have a moral God. Uh, number two, uh, write out the argument for the moral law. So number one in there is every law has a law given. Every law has a law given. So write that there. You've already done that. Number two is, there is a moral law. And what necessarily follows from that is, therefore, there is a moral law given. There is someone who has written on every heart the moral law. Yes? What about, like, like the laws of physics, things that are intangible? That technically are true, but are verbally, like verbally created. So this has nothing to do with those kinds of laws. This 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 has to do with morality. It, it doesn't have to do with, with science. But, it's, but it has the, to do with logic. Yeah, but the statement that every law has a moral. Um, it that means physical laws. It, that means like a law, like like the speed limits. Or the you know somebody made those speed limits. Uh, it's not talking about the laws of science. We're talking about we're in the realm of law. No, I mean if, if a law if a law that's just if something that is just true is given a verbal, like a verbal explanation, then it's, it's called a law, right? So the law of morality is kind of like that. It's not really something tangible. Just like I can't really like two plus two is right. And so if morality works Are the same way. Are you? Are you? I'm Yeah, I, I, am going to let you answer, but, but we're, it, it, that is a separate thing. It may be called a law, but it's not a law in the sense that this is. A law. It's, it's not a law in the sense that, um, like, something that the president signs into legislation. Um, but I, but I would submit, yes, there's a law given. God, God made that law of physics as well. Um, but it's not, it, they're not in the same category. Okay. I think the difference is that's kind of like a law of 
science, right? There's a law of the universe. You can't break that, right? Correct. The moral law, you can break. Given laws, you can break. And so it's talking about the kind of law, like, you can break it. It's not, in, it's not like, it's not just there for us to find the already know and be that you can break it, right? So it has to be something that can be given. Yeah, but I think I think the laws of physics were given in, in creation. No, I mean like you can't really break the laws of physics. Oh no, but exactly. you can break the laws of the moral law. That's so that's why there's a reason for moral law. Because yeah. if, if there were no law, there would be no reason for the And hence there are two different right, there are like, two different universes, universes maybe. Yeah, I, yeah. Just wanted, I just wanted I just wanted that's a that's a really good thought. That's a really good thought. Um so, uh, fill in the blanks. So, without an objective standard, an, an objective standard of meaning, the morality and morality, then life is meaningless. meaningless. And there's nothing absolutely right or wrong. Yes. So, there's nothing absolutely right or absolutely wrong. Everything is merely a matter of. Um, but we don't live that way, right? We might now. We might say, "Well, that's just your opinion." But when people say that to us, we're like, um, and uh, and we're going to talk about that. How how we know that people know that, like people who say there's no moral law, how do we know that they that that's not true? And we'll we'll talk about that. Oh, yeah. No, that is <laughs> yes. not the answer. Oh, wait. Okay, I'll give I'll give you a little yes. Yes. Uh, spoiler yes. alert. They, they may say, like, they may cheat on a test and say, that's not wrong because the teacher didn't tell us this question, so I didn't do it. But when, when someone does something to them, they understand it's wrong. When it's done to them, they know, but when they do it, so, so you, what the book is going to tell you is you can tell what people believe more by their reactions than their actions. Uh, yeah. I yeah, know like I don't know if you've ever cut someone off in traffic. I have not intentionally, generally, but um, generally. But, but a person might be this like you know uh, crazy driver that cuts people off in traffic all the time, and he's fine with it. What does he? How does he react when someone cuts him off? Ah, right. He knows it's wrong. Yes. A lot of the time, I feel like people's like what they believe shows their reactions. A lot of the time, it's like they're not thinking about how you react. Right. And so a lot of what comes out is just natural. Yep. Yep. Which is more proof that it happens without us thinking that we can about it. Right. That it's not just something that we thought about. It's not just like, no, not natural. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, number four. Um, we say that the, we say, when we say the moral law exists, what does that mean? Answer, Sarah. Everyone is. Everyone is. Uh, no matter how, what they've done, no matter who they are, uh, everyone has a fundamental sense of right. Um, it's why, um, you know, when my when my son, I won't name names, um, would go steal food. He wasn't gonna because he knew he wasn't supposed to eat. I said, no, we're gonna have you know, dinner in an hour, so don't give him. I thought you meant like yeah. from the no. restaurant or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, at all. So uh, he knew he was a little little boy and, and he knew he shouldn't do that. So uh, it is impressed on anyone who uh, has the ability to uh, okay, that's it uh, for today. Uh, and um, 